Halo is and always has been about its excellent combat, first and foremost, and the series' multiplayer offerings are often the most crucial part of the experience. But unlike so many other multiplayer-centric shooters, Halo has always also put a great deal of emphasis on the story. Microsoft's legendary series has told a very elaborate tale across several installments over the last two decades, sometimes to its detriment. And though the upcoming Halo Infinite is being designed to be able to stand on its own two feet and be accessible to newcomers, you are, of course, still going to get the most out of it if you have prior knowledge about the series' narrative events so far. We're going to take a look at the entire story of Halo from start to finish in chronological order, and here we're going to talk about Halo Reach. Before we begin, please consider subscribing and enabling all the notifications by clicking that bell icon. With that out of the way, let's get started. The vast majority of the Halo series takes place in the mid to late 26th century, with Halo Reach set in the year 2552. By this time, humanity has expanded its reach beyond the limits of the solar system and established colonies all across the galaxy, though at the same time, insurrectionists and rebels in humanity have been causing more than a little trouble for the United Nations Space Command, which essentially serves as the ruling governing body for the entire human race. To fight against the threat of these insurrectionists, the UNSC pioneered the Spartan program, which has enabled the creation of biologically and mechanically enhanced super soldiers. Human secessionists are far from the biggest problem facing humanity, though. For about two decades, by the time Halo Reach kicks off, the human race has been locked in a furious war with the Covenant, a collective of technologically advanced aliens who have been on a genocidal mission to completely wipe out humanity for reasons that, as of yet, aren't completely clear. By 2552, humanity has suffered major losses, and the Covenant have destroyed almost all of their major colonies and are edging closer to Earth. The planet Reach is all that stands between them and total victory, and as the UNSC's strongest military and scientific outpost, it has to be defended at all costs. In Halo Reach, which is set just before the events of Combat Evolved, the series' first game, players step into the shoes of a Spartan who goes by the callsign Noble Six, the newest addition to the Spartan group of elite super soldiers stationed on Reach known as Noble Team. In addition to Six, Noble Team is composed of their leader Carter, their second-in-command Cat, their heavy weapons specialist George, close combat specialist Emil, and sharpshooter June. As Halo Reach begins, Noble Six arrives on the planet and is introduced to the rest of the Noble Team, and the squad is quickly sent off on an urgent mission. One of the planet's biggest communications hubs has gone dark, and it falls to Noble Team to investigate why that has happened. They go in expecting to find secessionists, but they quickly discover that things are far more dire when they run into ground forces of the Covenant, who are the ones attacking the communications hub. Noble Team takes out the Covenant forces and secures the relay, and when information regarding the incident is relayed to command, they're quickly put on alert regarding a possible Covenant invasion. A couple of days later, Noble Team is deployed on another sensitive mission, this time to Sword Base, an installation of the Office of Naval Intelligence, or ONI. Sword Base is being attacked by a Covenant Corvette, and owing to the sensitive nature of the base and the work that is carried out there, Noble Team is tasked with driving off the Covenant forces. The group of Spartans is successful in fending off the Covenant attack, following which they are debriefed by one Dr. Catherine Halsey, the scientist who masterminded the Spartan program, who tells them that the reason the Covenant attacked the communications hub was to steal some important information. I could send you to the brig for interfering with my work. Maybe you'd like to join her. I'm sorry? We're currently under emergency planetary directive. Winter contingency? I'm sure you're familiar with the punishment for civilian interference with the Spartan deployment. Are you threatening me, Commander? Just making a reading suggestion, ma'am. A couple of weeks pass, but things have been quickly escalating in this time, and soon, Noble Team is tasked with heading to a part of Reach where there's been a lot of Covenant activity. The mission is headed by Emil and Six, who discover a massive Covenant invasion force. A large UNSC assault force is amassed following this discovery, who mount an attack to push back the Covenant. That landing zone has been tagged by UNSC command as a priority one target. Dead charge link is loud and clear. Copy that. Requiring signal lock on the pilot. 
After a ground attack is initiated the next day, it's discovered that the invasion force is being spearheaded by a Covenant supercarrier, and Noble Team's second-in-command quickly comes up with a plan to destroy the ship, though UNSC's stockpiles on Reach have run out of traditional nukes. Cat devises a plan to use a slip space drive as a makeshift bomb to destroy the supercarrier. The responsibility for enacting this plan falls to a two-person squad of George and Six, who commandeer a Covenant Saber and fly it up to the supercarrier while carrying the bomb. During the attack, however, the bomb's detonator is damaged, and George realizes that the only way to set it off now is to detonate the bomb manually. George throws Six out of the ship and stays behind, sacrificing himself to destroy the bomb and in turn, destroying the supercarrier. Listen, Reach has been good to me. Time has come to return the favor. Don't deny me this. Tell him to make it count. It turns out, however, that his sacrifice was for nothing, because merely moments later, a massive Covenant fleet arrives on the scene, launching a full-scale invasion of the planet of Reach. Six, meanwhile, lands on the outskirts of the city of New Alexandria, where he fights alongside the local military to aid the city's civilians against evading Covenant forces' attacks. Soon afterward, Six reunites with Noble Team, following which they are contacted by command with a brief message to immediately return to Sword Base and help destroy sensitive information stored within in order to prevent it from falling into Covenant hands. With a new mission, Noble Team moves through New Alexandria and fights against overwhelming Covenant forces, and during one particular attack, Cat is killed by a single shot to the head. Noble Team eventually makes its way back to Sword Base a couple of days later, where they come to learn some crucial information. Dr. Halsey leads the group of Spartans into an underground ice cavern beneath the base and shows them a massive artifact buried in the ice. This ancient artifact, she explains, was created by an ancient race of aliens known as the Forerunners, who ruled the galaxy 100,000 years ago, and the data that the UNSC has been able to extract from the artifact may very well be the key to winning the war against the Covenant. And now it falls to Noble Team to protect the data from this artifact with its life and ensure that it safely gets off planet. The protecting and overseeing of this data has been the responsibility of its custodian, the artificial intelligence Cortana, and Noble Team is tasked with taking Cortana and handing it off to the UNSC ship Pillar of Autumn, which is heading on a special mission soon. Take it, Lieutenant. She has made her choice. Do you have it? Yes. Say the words, please. I have it. Dr. Halsey hands Cortana off to Six, and things are quickly set in motion. Carter orders June to escort Dr. Halsey off the base, and as the group departs, it sets off explosive charges set on the Forerunner artifact, destroying it and any evidence of its existence, and in turn, any information it may have contained, with Cortana now being the sole remnant of that data. Carter, Emil, and Six make their way to the place where the Pillar of Autumn is docked, but on their way, they're attacked by Covenant, and Carter is critically wounded. Eventually, their way forward is blocked by overwhelming enemy forces, but Carter sacrifices himself by ramming his ship into a Covenant scarab to buy Emil and Six the time they need to push onward. Solid cop. Hit him on, boys. You're on your own, Noble. Carter out. The remaining pair eventually arrives at the Pillar of Autumn, and Six hands off Cortana to Captain Jacob Keyes. As they're preparing to leave, however, they are attacked by more Covenant forces who are preparing to destroy the Pillar of Autumn. As Captain Keyes, with Cortana in his possession, evacuates, Emil and Six stay behind to hold off the advancing Covenant forces. 
The Pillar of Autumn manages to flee successfully, but the Planet of Reach is overwhelmed and destroyed, while Six and Emil are killed by Covenant forces. Halo Reach's ending leads directly into the beginning of Halo Combat Evolved, with the Pillar of Autumn arriving out of slip space and arriving in a mysterious ring world discovered by the data extracted from the Forerunner artifact on Reach. In a final scene set 30 years after the events of the game, we see a cracked helmet of the long dead Noble Six lying on a grassy field on Reach, with the planet having been terraformed again and beginning to recover from the deadly Covenant invasion and humans beginning to colonize it once more. We recently kicked off our recap of the Halo series in chronological order, beginning with the story of Halo Reach. Unlike Microsoft, however, we haven't forgotten about Halo Wars, which really should have come first, but you know, better late than never, right? As the first game in the series chronology, Halo Wars sets up some important things for future games, and here we're going to talk about its events from beginning to end. Halo Wars is set in the year 2531, about two decades before the fall of Reach and the subsequent events of Halo Combat Evolved, the first game in the series. At this time, humanity has been under attack from the Covenant for about six years, with the fanatical collective of alien races hell-bent on destroying the human race and completely wiping it out. The game's story focuses on the crew of the UNSC ship Spirit of Fire, which is led by Captain James Cutter, with other major characters in the ship's crew being the no-nonsense marine John Forge and the ship's AI Serena. As Halo Wars begins, the UNSC Spirit of Fire is sent to the human colony of Harvest, which has been almost completely destroyed by Covenant forces. Cutter soon discovers that there's been a lot of Covenant activity around the northern pole of the planet, where they seem to have excavated something of great value to them. The Spirit of Fire crew takes on the Covenant forces, defeating them in battle and managing to prevent them from destroying whatever it is that they've uncovered so that it doesn't fall into human hands. After their victory, they discover that what the Covenant had excavated is actually a facility built by the ancient alien civilization known as the Forerunners. Soon after, a civilian researcher by the name of Professor Ellen Anders arrives on the scene and deduces that the facility houses an interstellar map pointing to various locations. Gathering data from the facility, Anders is able to figure out that the Covenant are next headed to Arcadia, another human colony. The Covenant soon launch a counterattack on the facility, and after repelling their forces, the Spirit of Fire crew depart from Harvest in pursuit of the Covenant, with Arcadia being their next destination. Arcadia, much like Harvest and many other human planets and colonies at the time, is under heavy attack from the enemy, and when the Spirit of Fire arrives, it finds itself facing heavy resistance. The ship's crew joins forces with a local group of Spartan soldiers known as the Red Team and assists them in fighting off the Covenant and helping evacuate the people of Perth City. They eventually set up a defensive perimeter around the city, and when Spartan Team Omega eventually arrives and provides them with added support, they're able to drive back the attacking Covenant forces. Now, with a little bit of breathing room, the group is able to figure out what to do next. A particular site on the planet full of undiscovered Forerunner ruins seems to be the area seeing the most Covenant activity, to the point where they have even enacted a massive energy shield to allow them to conduct whatever activities they are engaged in without too much resistance from human forces. That of course is where the UNSC needs to turn its attention as well. In order to destroy the energy shield, the UNSC employs experimental plasma equipment to break through it, while a grueling battle then ensues against a partially complete scarab. The UNSC manages to destroy the Scarab and punch through Covenant defenses, and Anders and Forge begin inspecting the area. Their work, however, is cut short, because not long afterward, one Ripa Morami arrives on the scene. Morami is a warlord belonging to the Sengeli race, known to humans as elites, and currently Morami holds the position of Arbiter, who's supposed to be one of the Covenant's most powerful and influential military leaders. Red Team arrives on the scene, but a little too late. The Arbiter injures Forge and takes Anders captive, and then immediately the Covenant forces pull back. They flee from the planet and enter slip space using their faster than light drive, and the Spirit of Fire is forced to give pursuit. When they emerge out of slip space, they find themselves in a distant, unknown location, close in proximity to a mysterious planet that no one seems to know anything about. This planet, as it turns out, is an ancient Forerunner installation known as Etrin Harborage, Etrin Harborage was a shield world, which were meant to be the only known places where one could find safety from the destruction caused by the activation of the Halo Array. There's a lot more to that, of course, but we'll get to that in a later episode. For now, let's keep our attention on the Covenant forces here, the Spirit of Fire, and what goes down between those two opposing forces. 
things on the S.H.I.E.L.D. world quickly take a turn for the worse, to no one's surprise. The Covenant and the humans, it turns out, aren't the only ones here, and both forces are attacked by a large swarm of an undiscovered parasitic alien species known as the Flood. We'll be talking a lot more about the Flood in later episodes, so we'll go into greater detail into what they're all about later on. But for now, all you need to know is this. They're bad news. The Spirit of Fire, barely surviving against the Flood onslaught, manages to discover the source of a signal, which seems to be a large body of water. When they arrive there, the body of water literally splits open, revealing the S.H.I.E.L.D. world to be a hollow, artificial installation with its own interiors and even a miniature sun. From the insides of the S.H.I.E.L.D. world, scores of automated Forerunner defense drones known as Sentinels emerge and immediately begin attacking the Flood. While the Sentinels and the S.H.I.E.L.D. world's own defense systems deal with the Flood, the Spirit of Fire enters the installation's interiors, takes on and defeats attacking Covenant forces, and sets up a base of operations. So what's going on with the Arbiter and Anders, though? For starters, why did he even need her to begin with? Well, Anders, as it turns out, is a Reclaimer. And what the heck is a Reclaimer? Reclaimer is an ancient term coined by the Forerunners. Reclaimers, you see, are the only people who can activate Forerunner activations like Halo Rings and Shield Worlds and other things. And only Forerunners, and humans, it seems, can be Reclaimers. Again, we'll be talking about more of this later on, so keep that in mind. Back to the present, though. What the Arbiter needs Anders for is to activate the S.H.I.E.L.D. world so that he can then take control of a fleet of highly advanced Forerunner warships housed within, and then use them to completely obliterate humans in their war against the Covenant. Luckily enough, Anders manages to escape, and eventually reunites with the Spirit of Fire crew, where they devise their final plan for how to deal with the Arbiter and his forces. They remove the Spirit of Fire's FTL drive, intending to detonate it so that the chain reaction will then destroy the Shield World's miniature sun, and in turn, the Shield World itself, which of course will keep the Forerunner fleet from falling into Covenant hands. The Spirit of Fire crew launches its final attack against the Covenant, who put up formidable resistance. The Arbiter's group of elite soldiers is killed by the Spartans of Red Team, while the Arbiter himself is killed by Forge, who uses one of his own energy swords against him. During the fight, however, the FTL drive is damaged. As such, Forge chooses to stay behind and detonate the device manually, knowing full well what it will mean for him. Son, I have a feeling before this is over, we'll need every last Spartan in the fight. I can do this. Report back to the ship. Good luck, sir. It's been an honor. The UNSC forces fall back to the Spirit of Fire, flee from the S.H.I.E.L.D. world, and manage to get far enough away from it while Forge detonates the reactor, destroying the installation completely. Of course, with the Spirit of Fire in completely uncharted territory and far away from human space, without their FTL drive, they have no way of getting back home quickly, which means the journey is now going to take years, decades even. The crew enters cryonic storage. A few years later, the UNSC declared the Spirit of Fire, quote, Lost with all hands. In a post credit scene, the ship's AI, Serena, wakes up Cutter, telling him that something has happened, setting up events for Halo Wars 2. It will be a while before we get to Halo Wars 2, though, because the next game we'll be talking about is Halo Combat Evolved, so stay tuned. As we count down the days to Halo Infinite's launch, in recent weeks we've taken it upon ourselves to recap the entire series story so far, and until now we've discussed the events portrayed in Halo Wars and Halo Reach. Of course, there's still a long way to go, and as we continue our Halo recap, here we're going to be talking about the game that started it all. So settle in and get ready for the full story of Halo Combat Evolved, from start to finish. Combat Evolved's story picks up pretty much exactly where Halo Reach ended. The colony of Reach has been overrun and destroyed by the Covenant, but thanks to the efforts and sacrifices of the UNSC forces on the planet, and of course the Spartans of Noble Team, it wasn't a total loss. The Pillar of Autumn managed to escape, with the AI known as Cortana aboard, carrying crucial military data and vital information about how to potentially defeat the Covenant. Also aboard the ship is the Spartan known as Master Chief. Soon after its flight from Reach, the Pillar of Autumn comes out of slip space and finds itself in proximity of something strange. As Halo Combat Evolved begins, the ship, being pursued by Covenant forces, finds itself close to a massive ring-shaped world of unknown origin. 
With nowhere left to run and the Covenant hot on their tail, under orders from the Pillar of Autumn's captain, Jacob Keyes, the ship makes for the ring world. At the same time, as the ship is being boarded by the Covenant, Keyes also summons Master Chief and tasks him with taking Cortana and fleeing so that the Covenant cannot get their hands on the AI and get access to sensitive information, like the Earth's location for starters. With Cortana safely in his possession, Master Chief fights his way through Covenant forces in the Pillar of Autumn and hops aboard an escape shuttle. The Pillar of Autumn crash lands on the Ring World, and a fair distance away, Master Chief emerges on the Ring World from his escape shuttle as well. Immediately, the Chief and Cortana set out to find more surviving Marines and crew from the ship, eventually meeting up with Staff Sergeant Avery Johnson. They discover that Captain Keyes has been captured by the Covenant and is being held aboard the Covenant cruiser known as Truth and Reconciliation. After fighting past more Covenant forces and using a gravity lift to get aboard the cruiser, on the Truth and Reconciliation, Master Chief and the UNSC Marines alongside him are met with heavy resistance. Eventually, however, they manage to find and rescue Keyes. Once they've reached safety, Keyes tells Master Chief and Cortana that the ring world that they're on is known as Halo. It's of great significance to the Covenant for reasons that are yet known. But, more importantly, Halo is also some sort of weapon. That, of course, means the control of Halo cannot be allowed to fall into the Covenant's hands. As such, Keyes orders Master Chief and Cortana to find and secure Halo's control room before the enemy can get to it, while Keyes himself heads out alongside Johnson to find Halo's weapons cache. The first step in Master Chief's search for the control room is Halo's map room, called the Silent Cartographer, where, after dispatching Covenant Resistance, he discovers the control room's location. Once the Chief and Cortana do make it to Halo's control room, some of the pieces of the puzzle start falling into place. But more questions emerge as well. Master Chief plugs Cortana into the Ring World system, where she learns, for starters, what Halo even is. As it turns out, Halo was constructed by the Forerunners, an ancient alien race that existed in the galaxy a hundred thousand years ago. More importantly, however, Cortana also finds out that there's something else locked away in the Ring World's weapons cache that even the Covenant are terrified of. Realizing that whatever is locked in there needs to stay locked in, Cortana urgently dispatches Master Chief to stop Keyes and Johnson from accessing the cache. As the Chief heads back out, he encounters a new enemy, the thing even the Covenant are afraid of and can't seem to handle very well. The Flood, a parasitic alien race that attaches itself to sentient hosts, feeds on them and turns them into more Flood husks. The Flood has started spreading with surprising speed and sweeps through human and Covenant alike in devastating fashion. With the release of the Flood, however, Halo's own defenses begin kicking in as well. Hold Get still! Out. Hold Get still! Out. Let him have it! Ah. Sergeant, we're surrounded! One crucial character that Master Chief meets around this time is 343 Guilty Spark, an ancient AI constructed by the Forerunners that serves as a caretaker of the Halo installation even now, or the Monitor as the Forerunners once dubbed it. Among 343 Guilty Spark's responsibilities, of course, is ensuring that the Flood stays locked up and restrained, and isn't allowed to spread, and especially not to get off the Ring World and find itself free in the galaxy. The AI recruits Master Chief's help in putting a stop to the Flood's advance. And how exactly can that be done? Well, under Guilty Spark's direction, Master Chief heads to a location known as the Library, a place that nearly all Halo fans have some not very fond memories of where he has to recover an object known as the Activation Index. This index, Guilty Spark explains, is the key with which Master Chief can head back to the control room and activate Halo's defenses in order to defeat the Flood. At the library, Master Chief encounters heavy resistance. Overwhelming hordes and swarms of the Flood assault him relentlessly as he makes his way through winding corridors and hallways and rooms, all of which look mind-numbingly similar. While Guilty Spark provides support by activating Sentinels, automated drones built by the Forerunners to combat the Flood. Eventually, Master Chief finally manages to find and recover the Index, following which 343 Guilty Spark takes him back to the control room with some urgency. Just as the Chief is about to insert the Index and activate Halo though, Cortana stops him. And here, the full truth of the Ring World is revealed. While the Chief was retrieving the Index from the library, in the control room system, Cortana learned about Halo's true significance. For starters, it's not the only one of its kind. The Forerunners built several Halo installations, and many are still out there, 
7 as revealed in later games, with the one that they're on right now being Installation 4. The Halo rings are indeed weapons, and one of their most crucial purposes was to destroy the Flood. Once activated, the rings will send out a pulse that will destroy all sentient life in the galaxy. The Flood, of course, can only survive and grow when they have sentient hosts to feed on. In the absence of that, they would die. That, it turns out, was the only countermeasure the Forerunners could find against the Flood. 343 Guilty Spark, as the monitor of Installation 4, intends to activate the Halo Ring, but upon learning the true nature of the installation from Cortana, Master Chief, realizing how dangerous the Ring world is, instead decides to destroy it. Cortana tells him that if he can get to where the Pillar of Autumn crash-landed and detonate its fusion reactor, the resulting explosion would destabilize and destroy the entire Halo Ring, killing all the Covenant and Flood on it as well. To do so, they will require Keys, whose neural implant is needed to destroy the ship. Master Chief heads back to the Truth and Reconciliation to find the Captain, but arrives too late. Keys, as it turns out, is dead, killed and assimilated by the Flood. With no time to grieve, however, the Chief and Cortana retrieve the Captain's neural implant from his remains and head to the Pillar of Autumn's crash site. When they get to the ship, they're forced to fight their way through Sentinels sent by 343 Guilty Spark, but are ultimately successful in detonating the ship's reactor. They narrowly escape its massive explosion, and race ahead through chaotic destruction and explosions as the Halo installation begins to crumble around them. After luckily managing to find a ship, they lift off and escape just in time as the ring world is destroyed behind them, killing most of the Covenant, Flood, and UNSC forces that were still on it. Realizing that the destruction of Installation 4 is just the beginning of humanity's war against the Covenant, Master Chief and Cortana fly away from the Halo Ring's remains. And that's it for Halo Combat Evolved. Next time we'll be tackling Halo 2, one of the series' most ambitious and large-scale stories, so make sure to keep an eye out for that. Just dust and echoes. We're all that's left. We did what we had to do for Earth. An entire Covenant Armada obliterated, and the Flood! We had no choice. As we count down the days to Halo Infinite's launch, our full recap of the Halo series continues. Last time, we talked about Combat Evolved and the Master Chief and Cortana's first mission together, which ended with the destruction of the Halo Ring, Installation 4, that the game was set on. Here, we'll be talking about Halo 2, and it's a much more ambitious and large-scale story. Right off the bat, Halo 2 does the thing that you'd expect a sequel to a massive new game would do. It expands its scope vastly, with the ambition of telling a much grander story than the laser-sharp focus of Halo Combat Evolve's narrative. The way Halo 2 chooses to do that is by focusing quite a bit on the Covenant themselves. Shown as one-dimensional villains in the first game, in Halo 2 they take on a more layered and complex role. As the story dives deep into their social order, their goals and motivations, the conflicts and politics between the many races that make up the Collective, and more. Halo 2 kicks off with a scene set on High Charity, a massive Covenant flagship that also serves as the Alien Empire's mobile capital city. The Covenant Sangeli, or Elite as humans call them, soldier who was placed in charge of Installation 4's protection is on trial aboard High Charity, who tries arguing that the presence of the Flood on the Ring complicated things in a manner he couldn't have foreseen. However, the Covenant High Council, composed of three hierarchs who collectively lead all of the Covenant, known as Truth, Mercy, and Regret, deem him guilty of failing to protect the Ring. The Elite is stripped of his rank, publicly branded and humiliated, and handed off for torture to Tartarus, a Yurohane, or Brute, chieftain, and one of the Covenant's highest-ranking military officials. This Elite, of course, goes on to step into a much more central role not long afterward essentially sharing the spotlight with Master Chief as one of the game's two primary protagonists. For now, though, let's turn our attention back to the Chief himself, who alongside Cortana has just finished a speedy journey to Earth, as the two rush to the planet to warn them of an impending Covenant invasion. Aboard an orbital defense platform aboard Cairo, Master Chief and Sergeant Avery Johnson receive medals and commendation for their heroics on Installation 4, while Commander Miranda Keyes also receives a medal on behalf of her father, Captain Jacob Keyes, who of course did not survive the events of Halo Combat Evolved. The ceremony, however, is cut short when Cortana informs them that a fleet of Covenant ships has arrived and launched its attack on Earth. Covenant soldiers aboard the orbital defense platform and Master Chief alongside other soldiers mounts a defense, driving them back. 
Other orbital defense stations don't fare as well, though, and the Covenant successfully breach Earth's defenses, as a fleet led by Regret lands in the city of New Mombasa. At the same time, a Covenant bomb is discovered aboard the Cairo Orbital Defense Platform. After literally throwing the bomb out of the airlock through empty space and back at the Covenant to deal a massive blow to their fleet, Master Chief and Cortana find their way back with Miranda Keys and Avery Johnson. Together, they head for New Mombasa to fight against the Regret's Covenant forces and protect the city. Immediately upon landing, they are met by significant Covenant resistance, but Master Chief is successful in mounting a successful assault. With his help, UNSC defenses drive the Covenant back and ultimately even destroy a scarab terrorizing the entire city. The Covenant suffer a heavy defeat, clearly having underestimated Earth's defenses, and Regret flees from the scene. His ship makes a hasty slipspace jump, which causes widespread destruction, completely devastating the city of New Mombasa, though that is a thread we'll follow in greater detail when we talk about Halo 3 ODST. For now, what's important is that Regret flees from Earth through slipspace, and the Chief, Cortana, Miranda, and Johnson follow. Here, however, Halo 2 turns its attention back to the disgraced elite soldier it kicked things off with, only, as it turns out, he promptly gets a chance at redemption, or well, perceived redemption in any case. Unlike Regret, the Covenant Hierarchs Truth and Mercy are still aboard High Charity, and they offer the disgraced elite a chance. He will be spared execution and given a chance at redemption if he takes on the mantle of the Arbiter. The Arbiter is the highest rank that can be given to an elite, but is given in times of great crisis. The Arbiter is expected to enforce the will of the High Council, and more often than not, whoever occupies that title generally dies with it. The Elite knows that, of course, but accepts the title anyway, becoming the Arbiter, which is what we'll be calling him going forward. His first mission as Arbiter takes him to the planet of Threshold, tracking a band of rebellious Covenant forces disillusioned by the High Council following the destruction of Installation 4. The Arbiter and the Covenant soldiers with him successfully crush the Rebel group, but when the Arbiter comes face to face with their leader, he receives some unexpected information. The rebel leader tells the Arbiter that truth, mercy, and regret have been lying about the Great Journey, which is the name given to an event of great importance in the Covenant faith, and is achieved by activating the Halo Rings. During this conversation, none other than 343 Guilty Spark also appears, who, as it turns out, survived the destruction of his installation and found his way to this planet, where he's been in the Rebel Covenant Group's company. In fact, it is because of what Guilty Spark told them about the true nature of the Halo Array that they grew disillusioned with the High Council. Before the Arbiter can learn more, though, the Rebel Leader tries to attack him, resulting in his own death. The Brute Chieftain Tartarus arrives at this point, extracting the Arbiter and 343 Guilty Spark and takes them back to High Charity. Things with Master Chief 2 begin to get even more interesting around this point. In pursuit of regret, UNSC Frigate in Amber Clad exits slipspace and finds itself in close proximity to yet another Halo Ring, Installation 5. This time, however, armed with the knowledge of everything that happened on Installation 4, they quickly jump to action. Knowing that regret plans to activate the Halo Ring for the sake of the so-called Great Journey, and knowing how cataclysmic that could be, Miranda Keys sends Master Chief and Cortana along with a bunch of ODSTs down to the ring to find and kill regret. Meanwhile, Keys herself and Johnson head down to Installation 5's library to find the Activation Index, hoping to get to it before the Covenant can find it and use it to activate the ring. Master Chief fights his way through Covenant defenses and reaches Regret's location. Around the same time, however, responding to Regret's distress call, High Charity arrives at Installation 5 with the Covenant fleet in tow. Master Chief kills Regret, but High Charity begins bombing the area in an attempt to eliminate him. The chief narrowly escapes, jumping into the lake but is rendered unconscious by the force of the explosions. As he sinks deeper into the lake, a giant tentacle grabs him and pulls him into the darkness. Back on High Charity, the death of Regret has caused some unexpected turmoil. The remaining Hierarchs have placed the blame of his death on the Elites, who have traditionally served as the Honor Guard for the High Council. In light of Regret's death though, they're stripped of their ranks, and Brutes, led by Tartarus, are instead brought into position. Tensions between elites and brutes have always been high, but this event makes things even pricklier. That said, the Covenant also have more pressing matters on their hands. From 343 Guilty Spark, Truth and Mercy learn about the process of how to activate a Halo Ring, and then task the Arbiter with heading down to the ring to recover the Activation Index, which they refer to as the Sacred Icon. 
The Arbiter finds heavy resistance on the ring, primarily from the Flood, which has broken out and is wreaking havoc on Installation 5 as well, just as it did in Installation 4. Meanwhile, Sentinels have also been activated, and also serve as obstacles for the Arbiter. He successfully makes his way to the library though, where he finds that Keyes and Johnson got to the Index a few seconds before he did. The Arbiter attacks the pair in an attempt to take the Index from them, but in the middle of their fight, Tartarus arrives with a whole squad of brutes in tow. He takes the Index for himself, captures Keyes and Johnson, and finally reveals to Arbiter the treachery of the Hierarchs, who ordered him to kill the Arbiter and oust the Elites from the Covenant's ranks. He overpowers the Arbiter, knocking him down a shaft in the Index Chamber into unknown depths. He is grabbed in those unknown depths with a giant tentacle, and brought to a place where he sees, also grabbed by a tentacle, the Master Chief. Their paths finally converging, the two find themselves in the presence of an ancient, sentient, massive creature known as the Gravemind, which acts as the controlling intelligence of the Flood. Also present is 2401 Penitent Tangent, the monitor of Installation 5, now corrupted by the Flood. The Gravemind and Penitent Tangent reveal to the Arbiter the true nature of the Halo Rings, causing him to question the great journey that the Hierarchs value so much. The Arbiter, Master Chief, and the Gravemind are, of course, all enemies of each other, and under ordinary circumstances this would quickly end in a firefight. Here, however, they all find themselves facing a common enemy. With the Activation Index, Truth and Mercy will be able to activate the Halo Ring, which will obliterate all sentient life in the galaxy, and neither of them wants that. The Arbiter, in fact, has plenty of other reasons to fight as well, what with the Elites having been betrayed by the Brutes in the High Council and being murdered in scores. And so, the Gravemind teleports the Arbiter and Master Chief to different locations. Master Chief finds himself on High Charity, where he fights his way through scores of Covenant soldiers just as their military command has passed over to the Brutes. Upon the Chief's arrival, Truth and Mercy flee to a nearby Forerunner Dreadnought. As chaos erupts all throughout High Charity, with the Brutes and the Elites openly taking each other on in combat, Master Chief gives chase to the Hierarchs. To make things even more chaotic though, the Flood, controlled by the Gravemind, crashes into High Charity, using the UNSC frigate in Amber Clad. Cortana realizes that the Gravemind used them merely as distractions, and as the Flood ravages the mobile city, Master Chief witnesses Mercy being assimilated by the parasitic aliens. As he's about to die, he tells the Chief that Truth, the last remaining Hierarch, is headed to Earth to finish what the Covenant started, and destroy Earth and by extension, all of humanity. Cortana urges Master Chief to board the Forerunner Dreadnought and chase Truth back to Earth, but knowing that the Index still hasn't been retrieved and that the Halo Ring may very well be activated, he is hesitant to do so. Cortana, however, comes up with a plan. She tells him that if the Covenant do activate Installation 5, she will detonate the engines of In Amber Clad, which in turn will destroy the Ring itself, similar to what happened to the Pillar of Autumn in Installation 4. To be able to do so, however, Cortana will have to stay behind on High Charity. With time running out, Master Chief promises Cortana that he will be back for her and boards the Dreadnought as he flees. And one final time, we turn our attention back to the Arbiter, who is teleported by the Gravemind to the Installation's control room. There is an uneasy alliance of elite and human forces led by the Arbiter and Sergeant Johnson, respectively, successfully fighting Covenant forces to get into the control room. The Arbiter confronts Tartarus and tells him about the true nature of the Halo Array. 343 Guilty Spark, also present there, tells the Brute the full truth as well, but completely blinded by faith, he refuses to listen to either of them. He forces Miranda Keys to use the Index to activate the Ring, at which point the Arbiter attacks him. A tough fight ensues, but the Arbiter succeeds in killing Tartarus. Upon his death, Keys removes the Index just in time to stop the Ring from firing. Even so, it seems ominous things have still been set into motion. Guilty Spark tells them that the activation and deactivation of the ring triggered a failsafe in the ancient system built by the Forerunners, which means Installation 5 has sent out a signal to all of the other rings in the Halo Array, barring the destroyed Installation 4, of course. The entire array is primed, and Guilty Spark informs them that they can all be remotely activated from another Forerunner installation known as the Ark. At the same time, Truth, Dreadnought, and his Covenant forces arrive at Earth, unaware that Master Chief has followed them back from the Halo Ring, and he's ready and itching to finish the fight. In a post credit scene, we see Cortana on High Charity, which has now been completely overtaken and assimilated by the Gravemind. 
In Halo 2's final scene, the Gravemind tells Cortana that he has several questions he wants to ask her, and she agrees to answer. And that's it for Halo 2. When we come back, we'll take a short break from Master Chief and Cortana's story, and focus instead on the fallout of New Mombasa's destruction and the events of Halo 3 ODST. In our ongoing Halo recap so far, we've spoken about Halo Reach, Wars 1 and 2, which means we're a little less than halfway through the series. Which, in turn, means that there's a lot left to talk about. In fact, given the fact we last left off with a recap of Halo 2, and given how the game ends, there's a truckload of important things to cover, even in the very immediate future. Halo 3, after all, is where Master Chief finishes the fight and defeats the Covenant for good. Or, well, for a while. Before we move on to that, however, we need to focus first on Halo 3 ODST. Halo 2's events, particularly some things that happen early on in the game, set in motion the story of Halo 3 ODST. And that side narrative is what we're going to be focusing on here. A quick refresher on the Halo 2 event that triggers the story of ODST, Covenant Forces, led by Regret, one of their three hierarchs, Attack Earth, with Regret's own Dreadnought landing in the city of New Mombasa and Kenya and mounting a crippling and swift invasion with overwhelming forces. UNSC forces, including the Master Chief and Cortana, follow defending the city and giving chase to Regret, but as he sees the tide turning in the humans' favor, the Hierarch flees, launching his ship through a slipspace portal that the Master Chief carrying UNSC frigate and Amber-clad narrowly manages to follow them through. That slip space is opened up too close to the city, though, and that rash exit has disastrous consequences. The resulting shockwave spreads out and destroys huge chunks of the city, leaving it battered and half in ruins. And with large numbers of the Covenant forces still occupying New Mombasa, the problems of the people there and those responsible for defending it seem doubly impossible. Halo 3 ODST begins slightly before that event. Its story focused on New Mombasa away from the Master Chief and Cortana's excursions to Installation 5 and High Charity during the course of the rest of Halo 2. As such, players step into the shoes of an unnamed Orbital Deep Shock Trooper, or ODST, known only as the Rookie, who's part of the squad of fellow elite ODSTs who find themselves preparing for a drop down to the surface of Earth and defend New Mombasa shortly after Regret's Dreadnought makes landfall. Besides the Rookie, the squad consists of Dutch, Romeo, Mickey, and their team leader Buck. In the early moments of the game, though, their squad gets a new member. Captain Veronica Dare is an ONI operative sent by command on a classified mission, for which they have tapped up Buck's squad to provide support for her, effectively making her the new boss. While Buck feels strongly that stopping and killing Regret should take priority, Dare reminds him that their orders have come from high up the chain, and need to be followed. And so, the ODST squad gets into its individual drop pods, and this is where we finally take control of the protagonist, the Rookie. But the drop through the atmosphere and down into New Mombasa doesn't go as planned, because at that moment, Regret's Dreadnought and the UNSC frigate jump through the slipspace portal, the result shockwave sends the entire squad careening way off course, scattering them throughout New Mombasa. The Rookie and Mickey's pods collide and crash before landing, knocking the Rookie unconscious. He comes to six hours later with one very clear and obvious goal, find out what happened to the rest of the squad. Promptly, he enlists the aid of the superintendent, which is the name given to the AI that runs and manages the civil operations of New Mombasa. This is where Halo 3 ODST structurally opens up in a way no other Halo game has. With the superintendent's help, the rookie is able to pinpoint where spots throughout the city where he might get leads on his squad mates, and players can head to these in whatever order they want. Once the rookie gets there, the game flashes back and has you playing as that specific squad member. So let's talk about what happened to them, shall we? Let's start with Mickey and Dutch, six hours before the rookie regains consciousness. Dutch lands in a nature reserve, while Mickey lands nearby as well. The two, with the help of marines that they cross paths with, are reunited not long after they land. Together, they decide to rally at a nearby ONI site, 
hoping to mount a proper defense of the city from there. The following trek through the city is an eventful and grueling one for both of them, involving everything from blowing up a bridge in an attempt to slow down the Covenant's advance, to having to flee from the ONI site and destroy it remotely, as they fly away in a pelican, so that the rampant Covenant cannot find and use the intel they have discovered in the facility. At this point, Dutch and Mickey managed to re-establish contact with Buck. So what happened with Buck? Well, he landed in a completely different part of the city and soon afterward was contacted by Dare. But when he got to her pod's crash site, he found it completely empty, with her nowhere to be seen. Soon he's reunited with Romeo, and after the two of them find Dare's helmet, Romeo guesses that she's probably dead. She isn't, of course, but we'll get to that in a bit. Soon, Dutch and Mickey arrive at the new Mombasa PD's headquarters to rendezvous with Buck and Romeo and pick them up, but upon their arrival, they're attacked by a formidable Covenant force. A long fight follows, which sees them suffer devastating blows. Their pelican is shot down and rendered inoperable. Romeo is badly wounded, and they're forced to flee from the police station. Ultimately, they manage to hijack a phantom and make their escape, but though their plan is to get far away from New Mombasa, they spot a massive Covenant force moving towards a specific point in the city, at which point Buck realizes that Dare isn't dead after all, and whatever her classified mission was, she's still at it, and has drawn the Covenant to herself. Under his orders, the squad turns around and rushes to get to her position. But here, we pause, and shift focus back to the rookie. After trekking through different parts of New Mombasa and fighting through Covenant forces as he discovers new intel about what happened to his squadmates, the rookie chances upon a distress call. It's from Dare. And when he follows it to its source, he finds her in the data center of the AI superintendent, which is a massive underground facility beneath New Mombasa. Here, she reveals what her true mission was, to fight through the Covenant forces flooding the many levels of the data center, get to the AI's core, and retrieve recently discovered sensitive information and prevent it from falling into the Covenant's hands. And what is that information? It's about something buried beneath the city, a forerunner portal that leads directly to the Ark, an ancient forerunner facility that can be used to remotely activate the entire Halo array, and in turn, destroy all sentient life in the galaxy. The Covenant's faith, however, has blinded them to the true nature of the Halo Rings, and they believe the activation of the Array to be a cleansing of the galaxy, which of course means that they have to be stopped. With the Rookie's help, Dare manages to get to the Superintendent's core, and even though the damaged AI shuts down for good as they arrive, the two of them discover something interesting. Merged into the AI's core is a Huragok named Virgil. What's a Huragok, you ask? They're ancient biomechanical creatures that were created by the Forerunners. Also known as Engineers, they've been enslaved by the Covenant for a long time, and as such, bear no love or loyalty for them. Conveniently enough, the one that the Rookie and Dare find themselves standing in front of doesn't either, and wishes to help humanity fight the Covenant. Dare, who realizes how valuable the Engineer is, has assimilated the Superintendent AI's core and contains all of the information and knowledge within it, and of course, has also been privy to crucial information about the Covenant. Deciding that her mission has changed, she and the Rookie decide to escort the Engineer safely out of the facility, out of the city, and into the hands of the UNSC. As they exit the facility, they finally converge with the rest of the squad. With the help of Buck, Mickey, Romeo, and Dutch, the entire squad narrowly escapes from New Mombasa with the Engineer in tow. They watch on as an overwhelming Covenant floods the city and glasses it with devastating explosions, completely destroying it, which in turn leads to them finding and beginning the excavation of the Forerunner portal. Before it ends, Halo 3 ODST still has a couple of scenes to show and tie things off with. A month later, Sergeant Major Avery Johnson is interrogating the Engineer and demands to know what the Covenant wants and how they can be stopped. The scene ends as the Engineer agrees to help the human race, a final post credit scene, which you only get if you finish the game on Legendary Difficulty, shows Truth, who is the last remaining Covenant Hierarch at this point, looking on as the excavation of the portal progresses. And that's it, the entire story of Halo 3 ODST. Now that that's wrapped up, it's time to move on to Halo 3 and finish the fight, before beginning another one with Halo 4. One thing at a time though, Stay tuned for our Halo 3 recap in the coming days. 
The launch of Halo 3 was an event unlike any other the games industry has ever seen. The legendary franchise's story would be brought to a close, and while Bungie would still go on to make two more Halo games with Halo 3 ODST and Halo Reach, Halo 3 would be their final game in the series' chronology, with the Master Chief heading back to Earth to finish the fight. It was an appropriately climactic story, and the hype and anticipation surrounding it in the lead up to its launch was also appropriately at a fever pitch. And in retrospect, it's fair to say that Halo 3 did a great job bringing that original trilogy to a close. Over the last few weeks, we've spoken about all the games that precede Halo 3 in the series' timeline, having recently wrapped up Halo 2 and Halo 3 ODST, both of which lead up to the dramatic conclusion that is Halo 3. Here, we'll be continuing our story recap of the entire series and talk about the final Master Chief story Bungie ever told. By the time Halo 3 begins, many dramatic events have set the stage for what's about to happen next. Master Chief was successful in stopping Installation 05 from firing, but that also activated the Forerunner installation known as the Ark, which can now be used to remotely fire the entire Halo array, effectively destroying all sentient life in the Milky Way galaxy. The Covenant have suffered some losses, with the elites having splintered off from the Collective and now fighting against it alongside the humans thanks to the betrayal of the Brutes. Meanwhile, of the Covenant's three hierarchs, only one remains truth. That said, the Covenant have discovered and excavated a massive Forerunner artifact close to the outskirts of the ruined Earth city of New Mombasa, which can take them directly to the Ark, and knowing the obvious dangers that that threat poses, humans and elites together are fighting desperately to stop the Covenant from enacting its plan. And of course, the flood is running rampant in the galaxy as well, with the Grave Mind having taken control of former Covenant capital High Charity, where Cortana remains even now. So yeah, stuff is happening. Lots of it. Halo 3 begins a couple of weeks after the end of Halo 2, with Master Chief arriving back on Earth and reuniting with the likes of Sergeant Avery Johnson and the Arbiter. After fighting through Covenant forces in their path, they arrive at a UNSC outpost close by, where they meet with Commander Miranda Keyes and Fleet Admiral Terence Hood, and together, all of them devise their next step. And that next step is pretty obvious at this point. Kill Truth, fight back against the Covenant, and stop them from reaching the Ark. The odds, however, are firmly stacked against them. The UNSC base is promptly attacked by overwhelming Covenant forces, and the Chief and all the rest have no option but to retreat, causing the destruction of the base with a bomb in the process. They reconvene again in the nearby city of Voi, but once again, their plans are thwarted. As Master Chief sets out to destroy Covenant anti-air weapons to allow Hood's fleet to destroy the Forerunner artifact, Truth uses it to open up a massive split space portal and head through it, with the entire Covenant fleet following him. At the same time, a Covenant cruiser under the Flood's control crashes into Voy, spewing out scores of the parasitic aliens. Conveniently enough, a force of elites arrives on the scene at the same time as well, and together, they and the humans fight back against the Flood to stop their spread. Chief, meanwhile, learns, thanks to Commander Keys and elites, that there is a UNSC construct aboard the crashed ship. Believing it to be Cortana, Master Chief retrieves the construct, but realizes that it is not Cortana herself, but a message recorded by her and left on the ship for the UNSC to find. The message, as you'd expect, turns out to be instrumental in informing the next phase of their plan. It's brief and not entirely detailed, but it tells them enough. Cortana says that the key to stopping the Covenant and the Flood and ensuring that the Halo Array isn't fired is on the other side of the portal opened up by Truth. And although Admiral Hood suspects that the message might be a trap, Chief convinces him that Cortana can't be trusted. And so, while Hood and the UNSC fleet stay behind to protect Earth, Master Chief, the Arbiter, Johnson, and his splinter UNSC force led by Keys head through the portal. They find, unsurprisingly, the Ark, a massive installation created by the Forerunners about 100,000 years ago, drifting ominously through space thousands of light years away from the fringes of the Milky Way galaxy. Unsurprisingly, things don't exactly go to plan here either. 
Upon their arrival on the Ark, they quickly find the installation's map room, where they learn that to access its control room, they're going to have to deactivate three shield towers. Master Chief, the Arbiter, and Johnson each head to one of the towers, and the former two successfully deactivate one each. But Johnson finds himself faced with an overwhelming Covenant defense and is forced to retreat. The Chief and the Arbiter both arrive at the third tower soon afterward to deactivate it, but when they get there, they find that Johnson and his forces are nowhere to be seen. And as if all of this wasn't chaotic enough, the Gravemind-controlled High Charity arrives on the scene as well, crashing onto the Ark. Together, the Chief and the Arbiter head to the control room, but at this time, Truth broadcasts a message for everyone in the vicinity to see. It's revealed that he has captured Johnson. The Covenant, as you might remember, cannot use and activate Forerunner artifacts and installations, which is why Truth needs Johnson. And just as he is about to force the sergeant to activate the Ark, Keys arrives on the scene, flying a pelican and crashing it into the control room. She quickly realizes, however, that she's heavily outnumbered by brutes and covenant defenses and decides that since she has no way of killing them all, she's going to have to kill herself and Johnson to stop Truth from activating the Ark. Half of that goes to plan. Truth kills Keys and forces Johnson's hand on the activation panel, bringing the Ark to life and remotely activating the galaxy's entire Halo array. Once again, a desperate situation makes uneasy allies out of Master Chief, the Arbiter, and the Gravemind and his Flood, with all of them being forced to work together to get to the top of the control room, kill Truth, and deactivate the Ark once again. After a grueling fight to the top, in which they are faced with strong Covenant defenses, they ultimately arrive at the top. The Arbiter confronts Truth, but their conversation is a short one, and the former ends up killing the latter. Master Chief, meanwhile, deactivates all of the Halo Rings once again. But now that Truth and his Covenant are out of the equation, a bigger threat has come to light. The Gravemind betrays them, to no one's surprise, preventing them from escaping. While Johnson manages to use Keyes' crashed pelican to flee, Master Chief and the Arbiter are forced to find a different path, and while they're doing so, Chief learns some crucial new information. It's revealed that a new Halo Ring is being constructed at the Ark as a replacement for Installation 04, which, of course, was destroyed by Master Chief during the events of Halo Combat Evolved, and quickly, a final plan forms itself in Chief's head. He decides to activate the new Halo Ring in order to kill the Flood, since its blast radius wouldn't deal too much damage to the life in the Milky Way, what with the Ark being far away from the galaxy's rim. To do that, of course, he needs an activation index, and he knows exactly where to find one. Cortana still has the index that they almost use on Installation 04, and so, with the help of the Arbiter, he heads to High Charity. There, he fights through the Flood, retrieves Cortana at long last, and sets the ship to self-destruct just as Cortana and the Arbiter flee. Knowing what's about to come next, the surviving forces of the UNSC and the Elites head back to Earth through the Slipspace portal, while Master Chief, Johnson, Cortana, and the Arbiter head to the new Halo Ring. In the ring's central control room, things quickly come to a head. The Flood has grown greatly, while the Gravemind is trying to reconstruct as well. Chief and the others fight through opposing forces, and just as Johnson is about to activate the ring, he's killed by none other than 343 Guilty Spark. Yeah, he's still around and making a mess of things for everyone around him. Guilty Spark, it turns out, views this new ring as a replacement for the destroyed Installation 04, of which he was the assigned monitor, and vowing to protect it as its new monitor, decides to stop it from being activated, and in turn, destroyed. Master Chief takes Guilty Spark on and finally destroys the annoying little machine. The Halo Ring is activated, and Master Chief Cortana and the Arbiter make a tense and narrow escape from the installation, first by driving a warthog through a field of fire and destruction, and then climbing aboard the UNSC frigate forward unto dawn. The ship successfully takes off, but their escape, once again, doesn't go exactly according to plan. Though, it makes it far enough away from the Halo Ring to not be caught in its blast radius as it attempts to escape back to Earth through the slipspace portal. The portal closes on it. The front half of the Ford Unto Dawn, carrying the Arbiter, makes its way back to Earth, while the rear half, carrying the Chief, is left behind, stranded in space, far away from Earth, and on the edges of the galaxy. 
Ultimately, though, the biggest threats humanity has ever seen are brought to an end. The war against the Covenant is over, and the Hierarchs are now dead. The Flood has been destroyed once and for all, and, of course, the threat of the Halo Array has been dealt with as well. Admiral Hood holds a memorial service back on Earth in honor of those who lost their lives during this long-drawn conflict, and grudgingly thanks the Arbiter for playing his part in humanity's victory over the Covenant, following which the elites head back to Sanghelios, their home world. And what about Master Chief and Cortana? They didn't make it back home, but obviously they're still alive and kicking. As the destroyed forward unto dawn drifts through space, Cortana informs the Chief that it'll be a while before anyone picks up the distress beacon that she's activated. Master Chief enters cryosleep, sleep, telling her to wake him when she needs him. If you finish the game on Legendary Difficulty, Halo 3's final scene shows the ship floating in the direction of a mysterious Forerunner planet, setting the stage for the events of Halo 4. And that's it! The fight is finished, done, and dusted. Well, for now, anyway. The next leg of Halo, under the guidance of 343 Industries, brings the Chief and Cortana back and puts them in the midst of new conflicts and stories. Of course, the Halo series' track record under 343 has been far less consistent and impressive than it was under Bungie, but from a narrative perspective, there's still plenty to talk about in these games. When we come back, we'll talk about Halo 4, the game that kicks off that next journey. Last time we left off having finished talking about Halo 3. That means we're stepping into the 343 Industries era of Halo now. And that, in turn, also means that things get a little messy. Halo 4 and 5 have both drawn their fair share of criticism over the years for their narrative deficiencies and disappointments. But even so, given how momentous the stories they do tell are, they're obviously going to have a big impact on what unfolds in the upcoming Halo Infinite, so here we're going to continue our Halo recap and go over the full story of Halo 4. Halo 4 is set in the year 2557, nearly five years after the conclusion of the Human Covenant War, thanks to Master Chief's efforts in Halo 3. For nearly five years, the remains of the UNSC ship Forward Unto Dawn have been silently drifting through empty, unknown space, and in all the time, Master Chief has remained in cryosleep, while Cortana has watched over him. As Halo 4 begins, though, the Forward Unto Dawn finds itself drifting by a Forerunner Shield world called Requiem. Shield worlds, as we discussed when we talked about the story of Halo Wars, were worlds created by Forerunners a hundred thousand years ago, and their interiors were the only places in the entire galaxy where you could survive the destructive beams of the Halo Array. As the Forward Unto Dawn drifts towards Requiem, it's boarded by a force of Covenant soldiers, who are part of an entire fleet led by the Sangili, or Elite as they're commonly referred to, Jul Madama. This fleet, as it turns out, is a splinter covenant faction that still sticks to the old Hierarch's ways, and even though humanity's war with the Covenant is over, some factions, like this one, continue to fight. As the Forward Unto Dawn is boarded by a number of these Covenant soldiers, Cortana pulls Chief out of cryosleep, and he's instantly forced into action. Master Chief quickly realizes that answers to questions about where they are and why they're being attacked by a Covenant fleet aren't forthcoming. So he quickly gets to work, fighting his way through the intruding force. As the fight progresses, however, every ship in the vicinity of Requiem begins getting pulled in by the Shield World's gravity well. The Forward Unto Dawn, which is already really only half a ship at this stage, is powerless to resist the pull of the gravity well. The Chief and Cortana attempt to get off the ship, but the escape pods are destroyed before that can happen, and the ship crashes into the interior of Requiem. Chief passes out. When he comes to, however, things only take a turn for the worse. Cortana, you see, has started behaving erratically, and she reveals that this is a symptom of her rampancy, which is getting progressively worse. What is rampancy exactly? Well, each UNSC AI has a lifespan of seven years after which it begins deteriorating and begins losing function. That process is known as rampancy. Cortana is one year past her seven-year expiration thanks to the Forward Unto Dawn's silent journey through unknown space for nearly five years. And that means her rampancy has actually progressed quite a bit. In simple terms, she's beginning to lose her grip on sanity. 
Be that as it may, Master Chief vows not to let that happen, and tells Cortana that if they make it back to Earth and find Dr. Catherine Halsey, who runs the Spartan program and, of course, is also Cortana's creator, she might be able to help them cure the AI's rampancy. With a goal firmly in mind, the Chief sets out to find a way to contact the UNSC. As you might imagine, he quickly finds resistance. Not only does that come in the form of Covenant fighters, it also comes in the form of a mysterious new enemy, formidable mechanical soldiers of great strength and unknown origins, whom Cortana is only able to identify as Prometheans. Eventually, Cortana picks up a weak signal from the UNSC Infinity, arriving at long last in response to the distress beacon Cortana had activated nearly five years in the past, in the closing moments of Halo 3. Their arrival, however, is also unfortunately timed. Cortana attempts to contact them to warn them about Requiem's gravity well, but discovers that all transmissions are being jammed. As such, the Chief sets out to deactivate the communication jammers, but sadly fails in the worst way possible. Not only is he unable to warn the UNSC Infinity in time, which of course means that the frigate crashes into Requiem as well, Master Chief also inadvertently awakens someone who's been asleep and imprisoned within the heart of Requiem for a long, long time. In his attempts to destroy the communication jammers, the Chief ends up freeing a Forerunner, a figure known as the Didact. In a nutshell, the Didact was regarded by the Forerunners as an elite warrior, and while we will be getting into exactly what he wants and why he was imprisoned in a bit, right now, this is what you need to know. As you may have guessed, he's bad news. The Didact easily overpowers and defeats the Master Chief with almost zero effort and declares that he heralds the return of the Forerunners to the galaxy. The Didact finds humans who haven't been able to bring the Covenant to heal to be unworthy of being the leading race of the galaxy, and more importantly, unworthy of the mantle of responsibility. What exactly is that? Well, back when the Forerunners were still alive and kicking about a hundred thousand years ago, the highly advanced and benevolent race followed a policy of shepherding other races in the galaxy and helping them advance and expand. That essentially was known as the mantle of responsibility. Back to what's going on in the moment, though. The Didact swats the chief aside like a fly, who, realizing that he's unwittingly freed a formidable threat, decides to head to the crash landing site of the UNSC Infinity, where he plans to regroup with them and debrief them about the situation. Upon making contact with them and meeting the key characters, such as Commander Thomas Lasky, Spartan Commander Sarah Palmer and Captain Andrew Del Rio, Master Chief helps an attack from Covenant and Prometheus, who've now joined forces under the Didact's leadership. Afterward, Captain Del Rio sends Master Chief, Lasky, and Palmer on a mission with orders to destroy Requiem's gravity well, so that the UNSC Infinity can escape and head back to Earth. After fighting through overwhelming waves of Covenant and Prometheans, they are successful in shutting off the gravity well, but in the process, Master Chief ends up being contacted by the lingering essence of another ancient Forerunner figure, the Librarian, wife of the Didact. Back during the Forerunner Flood War a hundred thousand years ago, the Librarian was in charge of indexing all life in the galaxy once the Halo Array had been fired. And as she comes into contact with Master Chief, she tells him what it is that the Didact is after. Before we move on, though, we're going to have to pause and talk about the Forerunners a little bit, because really, 343 Industries' Reclaimer saga, Halo 4 in particular, makes the Forerunners an even more crucial part of the series' larger story. As the Librarian explains to the Chief, in ancient times, hundreds of thousands of years ago, humans were an advanced, spacefaring civilization with impressive military and technological advancements. During their expansion into the unknown, the humans fought a war with the Flood, following which they came into contact with the Forerunners. Humans refused to heed the Forerunners' warnings about the Flood, which, in turn, led to a conflict between the two races as well. The Forerunners ended up winning that conflict, beating humanity and stripping it of its powers and its empire. But weakened as they were by the conflict with humanity, they found themselves inadequately prepared for the subsequent onslaught of the Flood. Eventually, the Forerunners decided that they would activate the Halo Array to destroy the Flood, following which they would reseed the galaxy with the samples of sentient life they'd collected, which included humanity. Some had different plans, however. The Didact, widely regarded as the Forerunner's greatest warrior, used a device called the Composer, which was capable of essentially turning living beings into mechanical soldiers, 
aka the Prometheans. The didact used the composer to turn all the soldiers under his command into an army of Promethean knights, seeing as once turned they would become immune to the flood infection, being mechanical and everything. Realizing he needed a much larger army though, the didact also started forcibly conscripting human prisoners and turning them into Prometheans as well. Many Forerunner leaders did not stand for this, which incidentally included the didact's own wife, the librarian, as well. The didact was imprisoned for his drastic actions, and the composer confiscated and hidden away. Now, the didact means to get the composer back to finish what he started, and ensure that Forerunners, not humans, remain the dominant species in the galaxy. As her final act, in an effort to aid him on his quest to stop the didact, the librarian accelerates Chief's evolution, reconstructing him on a molecular level, so that he becomes immune to the effects of the composer. With that in the rearview mirror, and the gravity well shut down, Master Chief, Lansky, and Palmer return to the UNSC Infinity, where the Chief and Cortana tell Captain Del Rio about the Didact's plan. The Didact has fled from Requiem and is headed somewhere with purpose, presumably to get his hands on the composer again, and Master Chief and the increasingly and rampantly pun intended unstable Cortana implore Captain Del Rio to follow in pursuit. Del Rio, however, is unconvinced, and fearing that Cortana has reached dangerous stages of her rampancy, orders her decommissioned, as you'd expect, Master Chief refuses to hand her over, and still very much plans on following the didact himself if he has to. With Lansky and Palmer's help, he escapes from the UNSC Infinity and, stowing aboard a Covenant craft, gives chase to the didact. He arrives close to another Halo ring, Installation 03, which has in its orbit a UNSC science facility. That facility, incidentally, is where the composer is housed. And though the chief does make it inside in time, as he's being guided to where the device is kept, the didact attacks. He gets to the composer before Master Chief can, and instantly uses it to turn everyone on the station, except Master Chief, who's immune, into Prometheans. Instantly, he races back to Earth, but Master Chief somehow manages to latch on to the didact ship as it flees. Soon afterward, Chief reunites with the UNSC Infinity this time with more UNSC forces and company. And now that the threat of the didact is real and very obvious, in spite of what Captain Del Rio may have initially believed, there's no denying it anymore. With the UNSC backing him up, the Master Chief attempts to stop the didact from using the composer, but it's too late. The Forerunner warrior uses the device to wreak massive destruction in the city of New Phoenix. Armed with the nuclear device, however, Master Chief boards the didact ship and confronts the Forerunner once again. Once more, the Chief finds that he's no match for his foe and is easily bested. By this point, even Cortana is running on fumes, and is essentially in the final stages of her life. She manages, however, to muster her strength to help Master Chief destroy the Composer and defeat the Didact, which he does by using a cluster grenade to send the Forerunner hurtling into a slipspace portal. Chief detonates the nuclear bomb remotely, and Cortana, using her last bit of strength, manages to teleport him away from the ship so that he can survive the blast. In their final meeting, the Master Chief and Cortana have a fittingly emotional farewell. And while Halo 4 ends with the defeat of the Didact, it also sets the stage for ominous events in the future. We're now approaching the final leg of our full story recap of the Halo series. Last time we talked about Halo 4, which ended in dramatic fashion with the death of Cortana and a new threat to the galaxy emerging. Now we're moving on to Halo 5 Guardians, which frankly is a little bit of a mess, but obviously it's going to be crucial to what happens in Halo Infinite, so let's dive right in. Halo 5 Guardians is set about 8 months after the ending of Halo 4, and much like Halo 2 before it, it splits its attention between two perspectives, each with their own stories. First, of course, we have the Master Chief, who's reeling with the loss of Cortana and everything he's been through. In the time between Halo 4 and 5, Master Chief was reunited with Blue Team, a squad of Spartan soldiers he used to fight with before the events of Halo Combat evolved. In addition to the Chief himself, Blue Team is compromised of elite sniper Linda, the scout and one of the Chief's closest friends Kelly, and hand-to-hand -hand specialist Frederick, who's technically Blue Team's highest ranking Spartan, but still defers to the Chief's judgment. Then we have Fire Team Osiris, another squad of newer generation Spartan soldiers. Led by Deuteragonist, Oni agent, and former assassin Jameson Locke, 
Fireteam Osiris also consists of combat technician and engineer Holly Tanaka, political liaison and intelligence agent Olympia Vale, and former ODST Edward Buck, who of course was one of the primary characters in Halo 3 ODST as well. As Halo 5 kicks off, elite warrior Jewel Madama's Splinter Covenant faction is still at large and sowing chaos, and events are kicked into motion when the UNSC is contacted by Dr. Catherine Halsey, who claims to have information about a series of impending forerunner attacks on humanity. The mission to extract her from the planet of Kamchatka, which is occupied by Jewel Madama's Covenant faction, falls to the UNSC Infinity, now fully recovered from the battering it took at Requiem eight months ago. Aboard the ship, Thomas Lasky, who's now the captain of the UNSC Infinity, commands Fireteam Osiris to head to Kamchatka and extract Halsey. Led by Locke, Fireteam Osiris lands on the planet and makes its way to Halsey's coordinates while fighting their way through the Covenant, but discovers, bafflingly enough, that for some inexplicable reason, the Covenant forces and the Prometheans seem to have turned on each other and are battling against each other. The Covenant as such are weakening, and taking the opportunity, Fireteam Osiris fights its way through enemy forces. Locke eventually succeeds in killing Jewel Madama, reaching Halsey, and safely getting her back to the UNSC Infinity. Aboard the ship, however, it turns out that Madama's Splinter Covenant faction is the least of their worries, because according to Halsey, they're all facing a much bigger threat. Here, Halo 5 switches gears to none other than the Master Chief who, alongside Blue Team, is on a mission concerning the derelict Oni research vessel Argent Moon, which was captured by Covenant forces. Chief and Blue Team kill the straggling Covenant forces aboard the vessel that are stripping it for parts, but while there, something strange happens to Master Chief. He has a mysterious vision of Cortana activating a massive mechanical winged monstrosity of some sort, and while there is much about the vision that he doesn't understand, it seems to be directing him to the planet Meridian. At this moment, however, Blue Team realizes that a Covenant fleet is approaching the Argent Moon, and quickly decides that its best move now is to scuttle the ship to prevent it from falling into enemy hands. But, while their orders are to return to the UNSC Infinity after the vessel has been destroyed, Master Chief, hoping to get to Cortana, who he's believed to be dead for eight months, redirects Blue Team to disobey their superiors and instead head to Meridian. Aboard the UNSC Infinity, Captain Lasky is forced to brand Blue Team as deserters. But, as Halsey informs Lasky, Cortana is a far bigger threat to them all right now. Though it was believed that she was destroyed in her encounter with the Didact, Halsey reveals that Cortana somehow managed to gain access to the Domain, which was the name the Forerunners had given to their quantum information repository of vast amounts of knowledge a hundred thousand years ago. She managed to gain control of the Domain, healing her rampancy in the process, and became convinced that she and the Created, other artificial intelligences scattered throughout the galaxy, should be the ones to inherit the Forerunners' mantle of responsibility which in short means that she thinks that she and her fellow artificial intelligences should rule over all the sentient beings of the galaxy and bring peace and harmony to all under their rule. The catch, of course, is that Cortana is now completely driven to do that, and is willing to do so by any means necessary. Halsey believes that she's looking for something that will help her inherit the mantle, and suspects that she might be manipulating Master Chief, and in turn, the rest of Blue Team. Lasky orders Locke and Fireteam Osiris to head to Meridian, capture Blue Team, and bring them back to the UNSC Infinity. On Meridian, Osiris is contacted by Sloan, the governor of the independent human outer colony on the planet. Sloan, interestingly enough, is an old AI that's in the stages of rampancy. Locke and Osiris, however, agree to help him fight off Promethean forces that have been attacking colonists, and in exchange, Sloan helps them in their pursuit of Master Chief. On their pursuit, the Spartans of Fireteam Osiris also cross paths with the Warden Eternal, an old forerunner Promethean AI that has long served as the guardian of the Domain, and has the ability to take control of several different Promethean bodies. When Cortana broke through into the Domain and took control over it, she outsmarted the Warden as well, and he now serves as her enforcer. Fireteam Osiris defeats the Warden's form and proceeds forward, discovering where exactly it is that the Chief is headed. He's headed to a Guardian, a massive winged machine that looks a lot like the one that the Chief saw in his vision aboard the Argent Moon. What exactly is a Guardian, though? 
Well, think of them as devastating peacekeeping weapons. The Forerunners built these massive weapons to enforce the mantle long ago, and each Guardian was equipped with several weapons for that purpose, such as powerful EMP blasts and pulses that it could emit to disable any and all electronics, weaponry, and anything else of the like in its vicinity. The Forerunners embedded various Guardians on a number of planets throughout the galaxy, and Cortana intends to take control of them all and use them for her plan. Osiris fights through Promethean forces as it gives chase to Master Chief and Blue Team, but ultimately, Locke is the only one who manages to catch up with them. He takes on Chief in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but predictably enough, loses the fight. Upon neutralizing Locke, Master Chief and Blue Team board Meridian's Guardian. It's revealed, however, that Sloane, the rampant governor AI of Meridian, had been working with Cortana all along. He was contacted by her before all of this went down, which allowed him to evacuate many of his colonists from the planet, and he now intends to join with Cortana and help her realize her vision of the galaxy. The Guardian charges up its slipspace drive, emitting EMP pulses that devastate Meridian around it, and flies off. Locke and the rest of Fireteam Osiris return to the UNSC Infinity, where thankfully they at least know where to head next. Dr. Halsey has deduced that there's another Guardian on the planet of Sankhelios, the homeworld of the alien race referred to as the Elites. The UNSC Infinity's AI Roland, meanwhile, informs them that the distinct sounds that the Guardian on Meridian was emitting as it was fleeing the planet was actually a set of slipspace coordinates that they could follow by inputting it into the Guardian of Sankhelios. With a plan firmly in mind, the ship heads to the planet. The Chief and Blue Team, meanwhile, are still aboard the Meridian Guardian, and find that they've now arrived at another planet, an ancient, lush Forerunner world. Their paths soon cross with the Warden Eternal, in a different body this time, but upon deciding that Master Chief and Blue Team are a threat to Cortana's goal, he attacks them. The Spartans manage to defeat the Warden, and promptly afterward, Master Chief is finally contacted by Cortana, who explains to him that when they defeated the Didact eight months ago, his ship crashed with fragments of Cortana still lingering on. It was here that she found the Domain and managed to gain control of it. She tells Master Chief her exact location on the planet, at the access point of the Domain, and asks Blue Team to find her there. Meanwhile, the UNSC Infinity has arrived at Sanghelios, and Fireteam Osiris is inserted into the planet. Sanghelios, as it turns out, has plenty of issues of its own right now. Thel Vadam, better known to Halo fans as the Arbiter, now leads the Sanghelis with the Swords of Sanghelios, who are fighting against the Splinter Covenant faction. The Covenant, meanwhile, are focused first and foremost on killing the Arbiter in an attempt to take control of the planet. A good chunk of Halo 5 after Locke and Osiris' arrival on Sanghelios is focused on the conflict against the Covenant, as the fire team assists the Arbiter and his forces against the Covenant. Ultimately, the Arbiter leads a final attack against the remaining Covenant forces, while Locke and Osiris fight their way to the Guardian. Though they are once again obstructed by the Warden in another body, they defeat the Promethean once again, and arrive at the Guardian just as it's powering up and preparing jump into slipspace. In the nick of time, Fireteam Osiris manages to get aboard the Guardian as it jumps into slipspace, while down on the surface, the Arbiter and his soldiers sweep through straggling Covenant forces. The Guardian lands, and immediately upon arriving at the Forerunner planet, Locke attempts to contact Master Chief, though the squad of Spartans soon encounters the Monitor AI of the Planet 031 Exuberant Witness. She explains that she's been locked out of her own planet systems ever since Cortana and the Warden took control of the Domain. The AI explains the full extent of Cortana's plans to attain the Forerunner's mantle, and use the Guardians to enforce her vision of peace over everyone in the galaxy by any means necessary regardless of whether or not anyone accepts her and her created, the other AIs that she's drawing to her cause as their rulers. With the help of Exuberant Witness, Fireteam Osiris sets out to find Blue Team and stop Cortana, though things don't exactly go to plan from that point forward. As Master Chief and Blue Team make their way to Cortana, they have another run-in with the Warden, and soon they realize that Cortana has been leading them in circles to buy herself some time, as she prepares to power up the domain system in full in order to use the Guardians. The Warden, meanwhile, seems hell-bent on eliminating Master Chief and Blue Team entirely, even though he claims to act as Cortana's defender and the enforcer of her goals. 
Cortana, of course, doesn't want the Master Chief dead, and ultimately, a confrontation between her and the Warden leads to Cortana destroying the Promethean and all of its bodies. Afterward, though Master Chief tries to talk Cortana out of her plan, she traps him and Blue Team in a forerunner stasis pod, known as a Cryptum. By now, Cortana's plan has well and truly kicked into gear. Guardians are being deployed, and hundreds of AIs from across the galaxy are arriving to join her cause and become one of the created. Fireteam Osiris attempts to stop Cortana from fleeing from the planet with the Cryptum, but of course meet heavy resistance on the way. Cortana means to keep Master Chief and the rest of Blue Team in stasis for 10,000 years, by which time she'll have properly established her hold over the galaxy. With exuberant witnesses' help, however, Locke and Osiris fight through Promethean forces and win control for the Monitor AI. As Cortana sends her guardians ahead throughout the galaxy and prepares to follow them, Osiris manages to pry the Cryptum from her control and snatch it away, just as Cortana's guardian itself jumps into slipspace. Master Chief and Blue Team are freed from the Cryptum by Fireteam Osiris, but all over the galaxy, things quickly begin crumbling. Cortana and the Created begin shutting down UNSC control all over the galaxy with the help of the Guardians, and start taking control of it themselves. That said though, she manages to track down the UNSC Infinity. The ship's AI Roland, who hasn't defected to Cortana, begins a string of random slipspace jumps so that Cortana doesn't catch them, which they plan to keep up until they can come up with a better way to fight back against her and her Created. As Halo 5 comes to a close, Fireteam Osiris, Blue Team, The Arbiter, and Halsey regroup on Sanghelios. Meanwhile, finishing the game on legendary difficulty also adds a final cutscene that shows an unknown Halo ring powering up as Cortana hums in the background, setting the stage for the events of Halo Infinite. And that's it for Halo 5 Guardians. When we return for our eighth and final installment in our Halo recap series, we'll talk about Halo Wars 2, which also leads into the events of Infinite, and introduces the Banished, who will serve as the primary antagonists of the upcoming shooter. As Halo Infinite's launch approaches, so too do we approach the end of our recap of the entire Halo series. Having spoken about nearly everything there is to speak about where the games are concerned, we now arrive at the final installment in the series' chronology so far, Halo Wars 2, set nearly three decades after the events of the first Halo Wars, and shortly after the dramatic events of Halo 5 Guardians, with the Banished, first introduced in Halo Wars 2, serving as major antagonists in the upcoming Halo Infinite, the 2017 strategy title obviously has an important place in the series canon, so here is the full story of Halo Wars 2. 28 years have passed since the events of Halo Wars, which ended with the UNSC Spirit of Fire drifting through unknown space, and its crew entering cryosleep. Since then, the ship and its entire crew have been declared lost with all hands by the UNSC, and the galaxy at large is a much different place, with the Covenant having been defeated and newer and bigger threats now looming large. Meanwhile, things have changed aboard the Spirit of Fire as well. Some time after the ship's crew entered cryosleep, the AI Serena terminated herself in accordance with UNSC guidelines to prevent entering rampancy. As the ship's crew awakens and the ship itself begins getting itself operational again, Captain James Cutter watches a message recorded by Serena before she entered rampancy, where she explains what happened to her. Following that, Cutter meets with Professor Ellen Anders to figure out what the situation's looking like for them now, and, as you would expect, it's not looking good. As it turns out, the Spirit of Fire finds itself in uncharted space outside of the Milky Way galaxy, drifting close to an ancient Forerunner superstructure, which is broadcasting an encrypted UNSC transmission. That structure is the Ark, which served as the stage for the climactic battle in the Human Covenant War in Halo 3, but of course the Spirit of Fire's crew, who've all been asleep for nearly three decades at this point, have no idea what any of it is. Intending to investigate the structure and the UNSC signal coming from it, Cutter dispatches Spartan Red Team super soldiers, Alice, Jerome, and Douglas, to the Ark's surface. Things quickly go wrong to no one's surprise. After discovering UNSC corpses, evidence of a battle, and what seems to be a deserted outpost, 
Red Team chances upon Isabel, a logistics AI that used to serve at the outpost. Though she is clearly frightened, before she can explain what's going on, Red Team is ambushed by a brute and taken by surprise, and are forced to retreat from the flight and fall back, especially with Douglas getting critically wounded during the scuffle. With Isabel in their position, the Spartans regroup and return to the Spirit of Fire, with Alice staying behind to hold off the oncoming attacking forces. Aboard the ship, Isabel explains the situation. The Ark was attacked by the Banished, a group of soldiers who broke off from the Covenant Empire at the peak of its powers and have steadily grown in power and influence in the years since then. Under the leadership of the Brute, known as Atriox, the Banished attacked the Ark, massacred any and all humans who were working at the UNSC outpost there, and attempted to seize control of the Forerunner installation. The deeply frightened Isabel implores the Spirit of Fire to flee from the scene and return to UNSC space. But Cutter decides otherwise, choosing instead to stay and fight the Banished. The first step in that fight arrives in the form of an attack against a group of the Banished led by Decimus, one of the original founders of the group and a top lieutenant of Atriox. The fight goes in the Spirit of Fire's favor, and though Decimus manages to escape with his life, the crew does discover data that points to the location of the Ark's cartographer, a room that serves as a map for the entire installation. While Cutter leads an attack on the cartographer in hopes of gaining control of it, Alice continues to rescue UNSC Marines on the Ark, and lead attacks on the installation's surface against banished forces and outposts. Things begin to turn around for the Spirit of Fire's crew, not only because of Alice's efforts, but also because they quickly manage to gain control of the cartographer, following which they also foil Atriox's plans, to some degree at least, by killing Decimus and destroying a portal node that was allowing the Banished to teleport their forces quickly throughout the entire installation. The tide quickly turns again, however, and their short-lived victory is followed promptly afterward by the arrival of Enduring Conviction, a banished flagship that engages the Spirit of Fire in battle, while leftovers of the ship's crew and UNSC forces continue to battle against the banished on the Ark. Anders, however, soon formulates a bold and risky plan that might just help them gain an edge over their foes. Before we get into that, however, let's take a step back all the way back to Halo Combat Evolved. The events of that game, many years ago, at this stage in the series chronology, saw the Master Chief and Cortana destroying the Halo Ring, known as Installation 4. To replace the ring, the Ark quietly began construction of Installation 08. And though that too was destroyed during the events of Halo 3, the Ark soon began construction of another replacement, or Installation 09, as it's technically called. Conveniently enough, it turns out that the construction of that ring is more or less complete, with the structure now lying in wait in the Ark's foundry, and Anders' plan involves using that ring. No, she doesn't want to activate it, of course. They suggest that they deactivate its firing mechanics, but send it through space back to UNSC space, where any broadcast they sent could be picked up by friendly ears. Thus, hopefully leading back up, back to the Ark, the Ark, of course, can only deploy the ring, which is meant as a replacement for Installation 4, where the destroyed ring was once placed, and with that location being not that far from Planet Reach, that would put the ring very much in UNSC space. On paper, then, there's no reason that Anders' plan shouldn't work. Of course, before they can get down to executing that plan, they have other more pressing matters to attend to, like taking care of the banished flagship, Enduring Conviction, with the help of Isabel and some assistance from Anders. Red Team Spartan Jerome infiltrates the ship through a gravity lift, which is far easier said than done, and succeeds in taking the ship out of the equation by manipulating the Ark's forerunner defenses against it. With some luck on his side, he's also able to make an escape from the ship along with Isabel. Promptly afterward, while Atriox serves the aftermath of the battle, the new Halo ring rises from the Ark with Anders on board. UNSC forces and the Banished clash in furious battles, as both sides attempt to seize control of the ring while Anders infiltrates its control room, hoping to deactivate its firing mechanisms and deploy a communications beacon for the UNSC. Incredibly enough, not only does she succeed in doing that, she also cordons off the section of the ring that held most of the banished forces and launches it into space, thus killing them. UNSC forces soon evacuate from the ring as well, but as it turns out, there isn't enough time for Anders to get off the structure. 
As the ring enters a slip space portal, Anders assures Cutter that she'll be back very soon with UNSC forces. Cutter continues to lead the fight against the Banished and Atriox at the Ark. Two of Halo Wars 2's expansions continue that side of the story, showing not only the Spirit of Fire's continued fight against their enemies, but also how a botched plan of the Banished sees the threat of the Flood returning at the former Covenant capital known as High Charity. With Atriox's timely intervention managing to shut the problem down and contain the Flood again just in a nick of time. Meanwhile, Anders' own trip doesn't quite go the way she had expected. Halo Wars 2's post credit scene shows Installation 09 prematurely dropping out of slipspace, with a Guardian looming large above it, and Anders looking on at its imposing figure, with the Guardians and essentially the entire galaxy being firmly under the control of Cortana and the created at this point, that probably doesn't count as a happy ending. Halo Wars 2's ending has left many questions unanswered. Of course, we don't know what Atriox has been up to since then, and how his plans involve Zeta Halo, the setting of Halo Infinite, how exactly they're working with Cortana and her created, and what exactly his orders to War Chief Ishram are. Whether or not all of these questions will be answered remains to be seen, but there's no doubting that heading into Halo Infinite, the pieces are certainly in place for what could be a very dramatic chapter of the ongoing Halo saga. So, what are your thoughts on this? Go ahead and share them in the comments below. And if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel and enable all notifications by clicking on the bell icon to get updates on new videos. We upload every day and would really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching.